Hi everyone, and welcome to my presentation on life in the universe, or in other words, aliens. So this is an introduction to a field known as astrobiology. It's one of my favorites within the confines of biology. Um, this is a real science. You can take classes on it in college. I did, and I loved it. Um, basically, I'm going to be introducing you to the ideas of what makes life special on Earth, why have we struggled to find aliens out there in the real world, and when we do find them, what might they look like? What could they be? Um, now, regarding this unit, there is no standard in Arizona regarding aliens. However, there are lots of standards regarding general science skills. So within this slideshow and this week, I'm asking you to critically think about uh, these scenarios that I pose to you, these questions, and just general things that I believe are, are good for any scientist to know. Um, regarding grading for this, um, if you have a grade in the gradebook that you're not happy with, and you do a good job in this assignment, I will allow you to replace that grade with this one. Hopefully that will give everyone a chance to get the grade to where they want it to be, and to give you a reason to pay attention and learn something about aliens. So without further ado, let's go ahead and get started. Um, hopefully you have found the attached worksheet document. We'll be working through that as we go through these slides. Um, final bit, um, with the worksheet, it may take you a little while, so um, feel free to pause the video as you work on it, and uh, when it's done, it's done. I think I'll set the, the due date to be maybe Friday or Monday or a little ways away to give you some time to work on this. So check for that due date on Classroom, and feel free to pause the video anytime you need to uh, work on those questions as they come up. So, uh, without further ado, let's go ahead to our first question here. Our first question, our opening question, is out on the internet or on television or wherever you may find uh, media regarding alien life, it's kind of incredible in the negative sense of the word. It doesn't have any credibility to it. So, I did a Google search for aliens and I found some pretty ridiculous things, all of these ridiculous things. None of these things are very scientific ideas. None of these are really talking about mm, a critical view of what could life out there be. Um, of course, we've got the, the meme guy from television, political figures, uh, Nazis, I guess. I don't know. Um, a fake autopsy. Um, and yeah, that's a dollar bill. Did you know that there's an alien on the dollar bill? Yeah, they, they put that there for sure. So, uh, sarcasm aside, why is it so hard to find credible information out there about aliens? Why is that so hard? That would be your worksheet question number one. So on that worksheet, find that, um, look for the blank associated with this. Why is it so hard to find credible information about aliens? And when worksheet questions come up, I will make sure to put a little... Um, well, it's supposed to be a thought, but it looks more like a fart bubble. Um, thought bubble will appear in the corner uh, when there is an associated question, so we can all stay on track. All right, now that that's done, let's go ahead and move on to the next one. Um, sorry to lose you with questions right away, but we have two things right up front here. Um, this next thing that we're going to do is going to be a KWL chart. So you've probably done these before. Um, as a graphic organizer, maybe at the start of a unit in maybe English class. Um, I think it's appropriate for this topic because so many people have ideas or have seen aliens, of course, in media or movies or uh, who knows where. So um, things that I want to know from you, um, you can fill this out. Uh, what do you already know about aliens? What do you say is that for sure you know this about aliens? Um, if that's nothing, then that's nothing, but I think you guys probably have some ideas, some things you know about aliens. Secondly, what are things that you just wonder about? What are some topics that maybe are related to, to alien life that you've never seen someone address before, or things that you've always thought about, or things that you have thought just to yourself while you're maybe stargazing and thinking about what the life is like out there? What are some of your thoughts, um, your, your wonders about aliens? 
Um, and then finally, the third column um, is for learned information. We're going to revisit this at the very, very end of the document, at the end of the video, um, at the end of the slideshow. And you will then say anything new that you learned or anything that you found important from what we talked about, and you'd add that onto that final column. Okay, so this one will be worksheet question number two. Go ahead and fill out those first two columns right now. That last column will save that for the very end. Okay, so now let's get started for real. Uh, first topic out there. Um, when we talk about aliens, we are always dealing in the world of fiction. We don't have any examples out there yet of real live creatures from beyond our solar system or even just beyond our planet. As far as we know, we are the only ones. So there's, there's that important question out there. Are we truly alone? Are we the only living creatures in this vast universe? Well, let's explore that question. We're not the first people to ask that. One of the most famous people for asking that question is Frank. This is Frank. He's, look how cute he is. Fra Francis Drake. Francis is the full name for Frank. Francis Drake wrote this math problem about that question. And I'll explain what this math problem is. It looks pretty spooky, like there's all these little terms, but they're just like letters with multiplication signs. So you can treat this as just in math class, like the letter X and the letter Y and the letter Z. They just have these little specific letters to tell you what it stands for. But it's, it's really not that bad of a math problem once you figure out what it's saying. It's just a bunch of variables multiplied by one another. Um, but this is the math problem he wrote. Each one of these stands for something. And he's very, very famous for it. Um, it'll answer the question, are we alone or how many aliens are out there? How you use this math problem is as follows. Each one of these different letters stands for something. So here's what they all stand for. I know it's a lot at once, but we're going to go through it slowly. So take your time, take it in. It's not that bad of a math problem when you really realize it's just multiplying. All right, first term, n. The whole grand total, what the whole thing is trying to find out is the number of civilizations like us out there in the galaxy. How many worlds are there with booming populations like us? How many worlds out there are there with computers and robots and cars and all that kind of thing? We know there's at least one because we're on it. So when we do this math problem, we're hoping for a final answer of at least one, it should be, because we are one, one civilization. But there might be more than us. Maybe there's some creature in a star system far away that's that's living their lives, uh, unknow, unknowing that we are living ours out here. Maybe there are aliens out there that we just haven't met yet. Maybe this number is more than one. So how we find that number? We multiply all these terms together. Let's pick through these terms. The first one seems kind of unrelated, but it'll tie together with the next ones. R star, that is rate of star formation. The rate of star formation. How many new stars you're getting? And this is usually done in years, right? because we're going to measure at the very end in years, so it'll cancel out. This is the number of new stars every year. Okay, So you take that number, then you multiply by the fraction, or the percent, F is for fraction. You can also use percentages. If you know in math class, fractions and percentages are basically the same thing. They're parts of a whole. Um, you take the fraction of those, of those new stars, that end up having planets. I don't know if you know this or not, but not every star out there, not every star in the sky has planets, but a lot of them do. Turns out that most of them actually do. Um, so we, we know this number, and, and astronomers also know the first number too. This is something that you can research and find out. You can look for new stars being formed. Um, so these are both numbers you can find out in nature. Um, the next one is also one that we're working really hard to find out, but we have not finished just yet. Um, you multiply that whole number by the number of Earth-like planets per star, assuming it has planets. So if it does have planets, how many of those planets are like Earth? For ours, we have, it depends on who you ask, uh, we have at least one planet in our solar system that's like Earth, and that would be Earth. We also have Mars, which is not unlike us. It's just smaller than us, and because it's smaller, it has a harder time keeping an atmosphere because it doesn't have the same amount of gravity. 
don't worry too much about that. But Mars is not quite like us, but some people would say that it counts. Um, Venus is also in the same kind of ball ballpark um, in that Venus is, is rocky and it has an, an atmosphere around it, it has gas in the, uh, on the surface of that rock. Um, but Venus is too close to the sun, so it's too hot. It has the wrong kind of gas. Um, so we, it depends on which, which person you ask, but in our solar system, we have at least one, maybe even three if you want to be generous with it. But that's the number of Earth-like planets in each. So we'd say maybe uh, for ours would be one to three, but we can get an actual number from NASA as we get more information from current projects they have going on. All right, next one the fraction of those that have life on them. Here we're in hypothetical zone, but we don't know that number. So assume that we get a planet. Assume that we get a planet that's perfect for life. It's, it's in a good temperature, it has water, it has a nice atmosphere. It's got a good amount of gravity. It's rocky, it's not too hot, not too cold. Um, what percentage or what, what are the odds that life ends up showing up there? What are the odds of that place end up having life? Now, that's that's hypothetical. We don't know the answer to that yet. We don't know the percent that end up making life. We know that we did, but we don't know if anywhere else did. So um, for now, we just have to take guesses. That said, there are lots of scientists that would like to argue that this value would be probably pretty high, that, that, that most of the planets, that if you got a, a good enough planet, if you got a really nice place for life, we probably end up seeing life. It doesn't seem like it's that complicated to get something really simple like a bacteria started. To get to something like us, you need to give it billions of years of evolution, but something simple, well, that might be a little bit easier than we expect, or maybe harder. It's hard to really say. Maybe this is nearly impossible to develop life on a, a, a nice, warm, rocky planet. Who knows? Um, the next one is another one that is imaginary, but you can use a little bit of logic and reason to come up with a good guess for it. Um, of those planets that end up having some kind of life on it, on those planets that end up having some kind of just at least bacteria, what percentage of those end up experiencing so much evolution that they get creatures like us? They get smart, intelligent creatures, creatures that can have a civilization, that can talk to one another. This is also something we don't know. Nobody's ever tracked that before. We know we have. Um, we also know that the only life-bearing world that we know of gave intelligent creatures, um, but we don't have a very big sample size. We don't have a very big selection to choose from. We don't know of very many examples out there, so it's hard to guess with this. Um, that said, evolving intelligence is pretty important, and it's happened many times on Earth. We have uh, intelligent creatures of all walks of life. They're very intelligent birds. For example, crows know how to count, they know how to use tools. Um, some of them can even talk. Parrots, of course, can talk, but they don't exactly know what they're saying, they're more repeating. Um, dogs are very, very intelligent compared to some creatures. Octopus, very, very smart creatures. Uh, and then humans, of course. Lots of times intelligence has evolved, so maybe this one would be pretty high. If we can get some life, something might end up getting smart. It helps you live, it's a good evolutionary advantage. All right, moving on, almost done with these, almost done. F of C, the fraction of those that end up having long-range communication, the fraction of intelligent creatures that are doing things like radio that we could see among the stars. So the fraction of intelligent creatures that are actually trying to develop technology and trying to spread information. Um, these would be the kinds of life forms that would be detectable. Things that if we used a radio telescope, we would pick up a little bit of signal from them out in outer space. So if they're using radio, which is a pretty common technology, um, it's pretty easy to, to find. It's just a, a modification of a type of light that can go through, through objects. Um, if they are still using radio, they would classify as you know, being in this group. So we don't know how, what, what percentage of intelligent creatures would fall within that group. Um, we did, for sure, because we use radio, and we would be detectable by other creatures if they were looking at our radio signatures. Um, we don't know if that's true for all of them or not. We don't know if this is 100% or if this is like 10% of those or what. All right, finally, the last one. The last one, we'll see if we can get that away. The last one, L, there at the bottom. Um, 
assuming you uh, you are in all of those groups, uh, that you are a newly formed civilization that is doing uh, communication, that is doing radio out to the stars that are able to be found, the last question is, how long are you able to be seen for? That's an important question, right? It'd be a real bummer if we found aliens, but they were dead already. So we, we want to find ones that are still living. So you have to multiply it finally by the factor of how long civilizations last before going extinct. Um, everyone would like to think that this is a long number. Um, it may or may not be. Some people may say that humans are close to being extinct. Some may say that we're going to go on for a long time. It's hard to say. Um, we certainly survived some really bad challenges. Um, before we were born, we survived, uh, we, we as humanity in a whole survived the Cold War, um, which didn't, at, at oftentimes, did not seem like we were going to. So um, maybe, maybe other civilizations tend to die out from things like that, from nuclear war early on. Maybe they don't Maybe they don't stop themselves from, from unleashing the nukes. Maybe they destroy their planets. Maybe something happens to make their civilization end early. Or maybe civilizations usually go on for millions and billions of years. So that last number, L, um, is another number that could be up for debate. How long you think civilizations will last? Okay. Um, let's get into Frank's numbers. Frank did not only made the equation, but he also did some research on what he thought each one of these numbers ought to be. Okay, so um, for each one, our star is uh, he, about equal to one, meaning that every year there is about one new star being made. About every year in our galaxy, there is the birth of one star. Um, we now know that to be slightly low, um, but it can change. Some years there won't be any stars, some years there'll be two or three. Um, but on average, every year, there's one new star being born in our Milky Way. So let's use that number. Um, the next number, the fraction of those new stars that end up having planets. Um, he thought back in his time that there would be between a fifth and a half of stars have planets. That's what they thought back in his days, like the 80s. Um, nowadays, after using some of our more high-tech telescopes that I'll tell you about later, we know that that number is much closer to one, meaning that um, one out of one, 100%, almost every star has planets. That's really interesting. Um, now, the reason for that is that planets are just heavy stuff that was orbiting a star that eventually clumped together. Like, of course, you guys have seen pictures of the planet Saturn with its big rings around it. Most suns look like that in their very early days. Uh, except for, um, imagine Saturn, but on fire. They have big rings around them, and those rings eventually, all through the force of gravity, clump up into planets. And that turns out that that happens to most of them. It happens to most stars. So for this f of p, we now know it to be close to 1. But uh, back in his day, this was his estimate, so let's stick with his numbers for now. It still gives us some pretty shocking results, even knowing that modern estimates would be even higher. So he had a, a low ball estimate. He thought maybe less planets than we thought. Um, of those that are near Earth-like, those that are rocky, what we're finding from uh, our telescopes is that most stars that we look at have between one, most of them have one, up to almost five planets that are similar to us. Planets that are small, not crushing, not super huge, not, not tiny, ones that are a good size for gravity and air to exist, where water might be possible, um, there turns out to be lots of them per solar system. And there's lots of these solar systems being made. So already these numbers are looking pretty good. That's lots of chances for life to start. Lots of new solar systems being made with planets. All right, now let's get into the hypothetical numbers. For these next ones, here's where he got some flack. You can see if you agree or if you disagree. He thought that if you have a perfect world being made, there's no reason why you won't have life. That's a pretty solid, ar I, I, don't, I don't know how to argue against that exactly. That's a pretty solid argument. If you have a perfect world for life, you'll probably have life. Okay, um, sure. Uh, if you don't think that's true, like if you think there's a chance to it, that, that might be the case. Maybe there's reasons why life might start for a second, but then end right away. Maybe there's some places with more solar flares or, or who knows what. Um, but he thought it was one, and I, I don't see a good reason why that that would be wrong. 
maybe you can let me know what you think. Um, he also thought the fraction of those with life would end up having intelligence. He thought that all of them, all life-bearing worlds, would eventually end up having intelligence. Um, his thought for this is saying that we've seen intelligence rise so many times on planet Earth. If it weren't for humans and you gave it a lot more time, some intelligent creature would have taken our place. Maybe it would have been the octopus with their smart brains. Maybe it would have been the chimpanzee. Even though they're closely related to us, they're still different. Maybe it would have been something very distantly related from us that isn't evolved yet. Maybe some very intelligent insect could evolve. Turns out some bugs are a lot more smart than we thought, even with their teeny tiny little bundles of nerves, they use them very efficiently. Um, who knows what could have risen up, but he thinks that, give it time, it will arise. He thought it always would. So he gave that a value of one as well. One out of one. Um, remember when we look at these, when we're talking fractions, if it says one, that's like a one out of one, and that means 100%. That's a little math thing. I hope you remember that. Okay, we on to the next one, another, next fraction. Um, what he thought um, of those of those civilizations that develop, of those smart things, those cavemen-like creatures that would evolve on those worlds, he thought that between one tenth and two tenths, or ten to twenty percent of those would go on to develop radio and technology and those sorts of things that we associate with with civilization. That he thought that uh, not that many of those smart creatures would go on to make it to a level that we would consider to be intelligent. So in his opinion, when he's thinking about all these smart creatures arising, he's thinking about smart creatures as in like, say, monkey level smart. But he's not thinking us level smart very often. He thinks that's, that's the one rare thing, that we are extremely intelligent compared to a lot of worlds with lots of moderately intelligent. I think that's maybe that's likely. I mean, he was a smart guy. He came up with this, so his opinion has some weight. Um, and then finally, finally, L, how long those civilizations last? He thinks that civilization is going to go on for um, starting around his time, around the time that they got really technologically big, they're doing radio everywhere and, and having computers and stuff. Probably a thousand years after that point, they would still be around in some kind of fashion. Maybe not doing well towards the end, but a thousand years, he thinks, is the minimum that amount of time that would go on. That was pretty optimistic for the time because the Cold War was still going on. They still thought they could get nuked. Um, uh, his upper guess was a lot more optimistic, a hundred million years. Um, I don't know that we'll make it that far, but maybe if, if we get to the point where we have decent enough spaceships, which we're pretty close to now, and we spread to all these different planets, maybe nothing will ever kill us. Maybe we'll go on for an extremely long amount of time. That's possible too. I'd like to think that's the future, hopefully. So, um, final question then. Uh, in his mind, if you put together all these numbers that he has, if you agree with him 100% on all the things he came up with, even the ones we know to be low, if you just use his numbers and plug them all into his equation, his n, his number of civilizations, would equal 1 times 0 0.2 times 1 times 1 times 1, and it's 1, 0.2, 1, 1, 1, 1, times 0.1, there's that 0.1, times a thousand years, a thousand years, would equal, you plug that into your calculator, 20. That equals n. n is the number of civilizations in the galaxy. So here exists one of the first pieces of mathematic, scientific, probab probabilistic evidence that something out there is likely to exist. Even using his, his low estimates, this guy's math, tells us that in our, our galaxy, there should be 20 civilizations out there with at least radio buzzing around right now. That's, that's a lot to take in. 20 different civilizations out there. Um, you can go ahead and check this link uh, out and find an, a resource where you can plug in some, some numbers for yourself and play around with this so that you can put in your very own estimate for it. Um, that will come in handy. Um, so now that we've gone over that, here is our next set of questions. Uh, so you might want to go ahead and pause and answer these on your worksheet. So first one regarding this guy, what was the Drake equation, his math problem, all about? What is that problem trying to solve for? That's your first question there. Second question is, 
what is your personal answer to it? Give it to me in a number. How many civilizations, how many alien civilizations are buzzing around out there right now? In order to get that, use the previous slides link. You'll want to go back in the video and grab that. And then finally, what does it mean? Analyze that. Tell me what, what do you see in the number that you are reporting? What does that mean to you? And of course, this would be the worksheet question number three. So go ahead, pause and work on that. All right, I think that's enough about Frank Drake, as much as I love to talk about him and his wonderful equation. Um, let's instead talk about who he worked for. This here is a link to uh, the organization known as SETI. And it's an acronym for the Search for Extraterrestrial Intelligence. Um, now, they're an organization that is dedicated to trying to find aliens out there in the vast cosmos. Um, they're also famous for working with a, a very famous popular scientist of maybe your grandparents' generation. He's, um, he's, he's long been, been passed away now, but he made some really big contributions to astronomy, to uh, the field of biology, to, to science in general. Um, and he had an excellent television show that a lot of people enjoyed watching. It was called Cosmos. Um, I, I would encourage you to go check it out. It's, it's not too bad. It's, it's not black and white. It's in color. It's, it's pretty good stuff. Um, that nowadays, Cosmos has been taken on by the popular scientist Neil deGrasse Tyson. You might know him. Um, Neil deGrasse Tyson was a student of, of uh, Carl Sagan. Um, anyway, let's, uh, let's move on to what he did, though. Carl Sagan, of, of one of the many things he did, uh, he sent out a message to space. This design over here on the side, that's not just a cool doodle. That is, that is the message that he and his team designed and sent out to space. So let, let's talk about that. Um, the year was 1974, so again, probably your grandparents' generation, or maybe if you have some older parents. Um, and uh, this is the Arecibo, Arecibo uh, Radio Telescope Array. Um, this facility sent out a stream of data, um, kind of like Morse code. Uh, and it, this was the data that it sent out. It beamed out that radio sequence out into space, just right up in the air, out to space. And it sent it at a star system uh, far away. And hopefully uh, they received it. We don't know, but uh, uh, we'll, we'll know in a, a number of years. It still is on its way. It's very, very far away. Um, anyway, uh, the, the signal that they sent out, it was kind of like Morse code, but they would send out a little beep, 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 beep in a current timing. And, and if, you, if you put all those beeps in an order where the beeps would be one of these pixels, and you did it like, uh, I think it went like this direction for some reason, um, then you would... Uh, you would get this picture if you put all those beeps together. So it'd be like silence, silence, beep, 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 next line, beep, 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 beep next line, and, and so on and so forth. It would, it would just uh, beep out into space. And you could put that together into a picture. Now those beeps were super strong and they were obviously not natural. So if there was something there, their scientists would know to look at this thing. So this message, if there are people sitting there, it was probably received. So uh, let, let's talk about what was sent, what they said out to space. Um, so for go, here going on, this is supposed to be the numbers from one to 10. I think uh, the way it's supposed to be is kind of like binary, if you know binary, but uh, let's, let's look at it. This would be one, and then this would be two, so it'd have one above it. This is three, so that'd be the two plus the one. Four, five would be a four plus a one. Six would be a four plus a two. Kind of like binary, um, and the, you can see they, they go on. There's actually new placeholders and stuff. Um, those are our numbers. So we told them basically, hey, we got math. We're good at that. Um, next thing we did is using those numbers, we did the atomic numbers of hydrogen, carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, and phosphorus. Does that group sound familiar to you? C H O N P. That's chomp people. That's us. We sent out what we're made out of. This that's this block. So like, hey, we can count, and we're made of chomp. Those are the first two things I thought were important about life. So uh, there you go. Uh, enjoy biology class and math class were the most important. <laughs> okay, um, next things they got are formulas for the building blocks of DNA. Now how this reads out to that, I don't know. I think if, if they can decipher this much so far, they probably already have some smart scientists working on it. I'm sure those scientists can figure out what this is too. Um, but apparently this information here in green is all of the building blocks of DNA. 
Next thing we got is um, the actual like visual representation of what our DNA looks like, the double helix. And um, right here in the middle, that is a number as per above. This is how many of these nucleotides we got. Okay, next thing, uh, here's a stick figure. That's us, a little, little drawing of us. Um, and uh, let's see, population of the Earth, that's over here. How many people are in planet Earth? We sent that. And um, the height. And that, that's used in, in units of the wavelength of the transmission. And so like when they send this out there, that wave that comes out there, like the size of the wave, like from one peak down to the next peak, like from one wave to the next wave, that's a certain distance. And so they multiplied that by this number and they said, okay, that's how tall we are. That's pretty clever, right? And they took the wavelength and inherent property of the message and they did that just to give an idea of how tall they are. Now, whether or not an alien race could figure that out, that's debatable. But if they got this far, they have their top scientists working on it, so maybe they could. All right, next one, here's a picture of our solar system. There's the sun, Mercury, Venus, Earth, us raised up one to show that's us. Um, Mars, the big planet, that's Jupiter, big planet, that's Saturn. Um, Neptune, uh, the funny planet, um, and so on. Uh, then here is a picture of the actual satellite array. Cool, right? So a question posed to you, boop, worksheet question number four. Um, if you had to send a message to aliens who couldn't speak English, what would you send? What, what would you change? What would you add to this maybe? Or if you were to scrap the whole thing and send something different, what would you say? Moving on. So um, let's talk a little bit more about radio signaling. So um, how that works, anything that gives off a radio signal, be it a radio tower or like um, old school televisions, um, they all blast out in every direction. There, there's no direction that you have to be from a radio tower in order to get the signal. As long as it's within range, you can get the signal, like like cell phones or Wi-Fi. Um, it's all the same stuff. It's all electromagnetic radiation. Now, um, they go out in all directions, and that doesn't mean just on the surface of the Earth. Like Wi-Fi doesn't just spread across the surface. It also spreads up, too. Of course it goes up. I mean, why wouldn't it go up? And when it goes up, and when it eventually gets to space, as the air gets thinner and thinner, it goes easier and easier. So even pretty weak signals on Earth can really easily get out and leak into space. Um, we've been doing that. Our planet has been leaking radio signals for as long as we've had radios. Um, our first radio broadcast on planet Earth was way back in the year 1880. That was the first experiments with radio. Um, so, uh, I first prepared this slideshow two years ago, so let's back that up a little bit. Um, 2020 minus 1880 would be 140 years. Okay. Um, if we were to do the math of that, if we were to convert that years into light years, how far these waves would have traveled in that amount of time, we would then get a number that would be a little bit off now because of this, this number difference. Close to, uh, well, this gigantic one. How do I read that? Let's see, this is hundreds, thousands, millions, billions, 811 trillion miles. So that's how far our radio signals have gone from Earth from that very first one. Right, so in those radio signals would be all sorts of events from early wars to World War I, World War II, uh, the Olympics being on TV, um, all things, the JFK assassination, 9-11, uh, uh, all that information is out in space somewhere. Um, now, if we compare that, that miles, that size of the bubble around us, that how far these waves have traveled, like this circle is now this many miles in radius from the middle to the outside. If we were to look on a big old grand map of the Milky Way, our radio bubble, how big we are visible in, how far our signal has spread, um, who has basically heard us, who, who could have possibly noticed us, is this size, that little red dot, compared to the size of the Milky Way. That kind of puts in perspective that if there are aliens out there, they would have only heard us if they were already within this dot. If there's aliens over here, 
our very first message is still sending to them. They would not have gotten that very first 1880 radio signal yet. They would have no idea that we exist. Okay, there's no way. So this is the size of our radio bubble, how far away we can be heard from. If there was a civilization far away though, and they've been existing for a very, very, very long time, maybe their bubble would be more of a larger circle. But that wouldn't necessarily even be reaching us yet if they were far enough away. All these different civilizations out there would have different sizes of bubbles that they would be discoverable within. Um, we might be able to see someone's bubble, someone's bubble might be overlapping us, but if they're here in the middle, if they actually live there, our bubble hasn't hit them yet. Um, so if you did it as a percentage, the, the percent of the size of the Milky Way that we've actually covered is 0.13%. So that, that's the share of the whole thing is 0.13%. So um, we are not uh, very well known in our galaxy. So that might be one of the reasons why we haven't heard from anyone yet. Um, we have maybe heard some things though. So this handsome man, that's Jerry Ehrman. Um, this guy in 1977 uh, maybe heard the only thing we've ever heard from aliens ever, maybe. So um, he was in this big ear telescope, um, fitting, right? Um, he was sitting there uh, listening to the sky, waiting for messages coming down. Um, and um, from space, a big wave, very, very strong, very intense, came down and hit the reflector and went right into the observatory. And this was the evidence of that wave hitting. So you can see um, as this computer, these old school computers, they used to like do printouts on paper. And as the paper would roll through, we would do a little stamp on it. So uh, the number would be how strong the signal is it receiving. Um, it started at zero and it went one through nine. Then after nine, then it uh, went to A, B, C, D, E, F, G to count like higher numbers. That's how you can count like a higher number in just one digit space. So basically what you need to know is that letters are a much higher number than a number. So a letter is a very big signal and like late letters, like Q that's late in the alphabet, um, those ones are even bigger numbers than like E, which is early in the alphabet. Um, basically on a normal day, you get ones, twos, and a four every now and then. Um, and you can see the six was already circled because they're like, oh, that's pretty notable. They got this huge blast of five, J, U, Q, E, six, and faded away. We don't know what it was, but some giant signal hit us, and it was like a big static bzzz, and then it went off. And it certainly seemed like a big blast of something not natural. That kind of focus signal hitting us, it's very, very strange. And we haven't seen anything like that ever again. That was 1977. We don't know if that was a response to our signal. We don't know what it was. We don't, we don't know what it was. Oh, but they called it the wow signal. The wow signal. So if you want to Google and learn more about this, Google for wow signal. So it begs the question, is there anyone out there? Hello. So that's that's the paradox. That's the Fermi paradox that we were getting to with the assignments yesterday. The Fermi paradox is the big question, is anyone out there? If there are so many aliens, according to Frank Drake and according to what we look like, what 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 we know of astrobiology, um, why have we not seen anything so far? Um, I would like you to go ahead and try to pose your own answer to this question before I show you some professional answers to it. Um, there are hundreds of, of possible answers to it, so um, whatever your answer to this question is or these two questions are, um, it's probably a good one. I mean, we don't have the answer yet, um, but some uh, professional scientists have put forward some pretty solid ideas that I'm going to share with you next. But I want your own ideas first, so please don't copy one of the ones that I'm going to talk about, um, at least not word for word. At least uh, tell me what you think the answer to this question is before we get into the next one. Okay, and this one will be, this is worksheet question number five. All right, let's go ahead and move on. Hopefully you paused and answered that question, and let's move on to the next bits. So here's, uh, I promise you some answers, some professional ones for uh, this Fermi paradox, some reasons why aliens may not have 
seen us yet or why we haven't seen them, why there hasn't been contact. So the first common answer, um, and it's a pretty good one, is that maybe extraterrestrial life is rare or otherwise, or the, other than us, non-existent. Maybe we are super precious. We are the only ones that are that are out there. That it doesn't exist anywhere but Earth. Um, I suppose that's possible. It doesn't seem like that should be true, knowing how many planets there are. But maybe that is possible. Maybe there's reasons for that. Maybe there's uh, uh, unique things about Earth, or maybe there's religious reasons that we're the only ones. Uh, we don't know. Um, we don't know, but maybe that's the case. And if that's the case, then that's the case. Um, but in order for that to be true, though, this equation doesn't just disappear. This still has to be true, and we still have to get an answer of one, because that's us, right? So this equation must answer to one. And to get this to exactly answer to one, with all these numbers multiplying together, to make that equal one exactly on the dot, that takes some really specific numbers, really specific numbers. Now, I suppose the argument is that if, if we were to, to modify the universe in some way to give us the perfect answer of one, of us being the only ones, then, well, that's something that the creator of the universe could easily do, right? They could choose any numbers for these that they wanted to and make it so that we are the only one. Maybe these ones that we don't know about yet, maybe these are extremely, extremely low values. Maybe there's extremely low amounts of life out there than what we expect. Maybe there's extremely low amounts of intelligence versus how much life there is, or so on and so forth. Or, well, we'll get into that. Um, second one is similar to that. Um, uh, maybe if this number is really low, if, if we haven't seen anything, is because most things out there are not smart. Um, maybe most maybe most living things are nothing more than just some bugs or uh, not that bugs are really dumb like they still have some clever tricks to them but they're not intelligent like we are um, so maybe that f of i that fraction of life out there that ends up growing to be intelligent maybe that's a lot lower than what we'd expect um, i also don't really think that that would be the case because we see so many intelligent life forms here on earth but maybe earth is just a a very smart planet in a, a, a galaxy of dum-dums. Number three is a little depressing, but it might be the case. Um, this last one, this last term in the uh, Drake equation here, the length of civilizations, maybe civilizations are always doomed to fail. Maybe they're always extremely short-lived. Maybe we won't grow to be a million years old as a civilization. Maybe it's going to be over in the next uh, hundred years. Um, that's possible in, in a number of ways, um, be it either uh, fire and fury or through a, a slightly slower yet still pressing and imminent death of, of climate of climate change. Um, or we can see some horrors that no one's even done yet, like uh, genetically engineered and lab created viruses or or um, who knows what nanotechnology in some kind of horrifying way or robots in some kind of terrible way. Maybe civilization itself is meant to not live. Maybe it just doesn't end up living very long and that makes this number low. If this was, you know, civilizations only live for about a hundred years after they end up being advanced, then so what if these numbers are high, if that one's very, very small. Um, next one, uh, this one ties in with L. Um, maybe, uh, maybe civilizations don't last very long because something keeps destroying them. Um, this is something that's kind of hard to really get into without getting into the world of fiction because it's not nothing that we have seen so far. It's nothing that, that we really have any reason to believe should be true, but maybe it's just the case that when, when creatures get so advanced, um, something just comes and wipes them out. Maybe there's like intergalactic Vikings out there that fly around and whenever there's a civilization that they notice they're like oh look at these guys they're putting out some radio signals let's go get them and then uh, these space pirates fly to planets and destroy any planets that are new um, for whatever reasons they have maybe they just hate life maybe they're robots that really don't like organic beings or something who knows but maybe uh, maybe we don't hear from anything because everyone's dead <laughs> um, I don't know how likely that is. Uh, maybe. I, I, who knows? I, I hope not. 
Um, next one also goes in with having a small L value would be maybe life usually gets wiped out all the time and we're lucky that we haven't been yet. If we look at the, our galaxy, we are somewhere out here in one of the, the arms, kind of far away from the craziness in the middle. It's pretty calm out here. There's not that many meteors or asteroids. There's not that many supernovas. There's not that many bad things happening way out in our calm suburbs. But in towards the the version of the city, like in towards the middle of this galaxy, it's crazy intense with these things flying around like crazy and stars blow up all the time. Maybe that ends up wiping out life all the time and it doesn't get enough time to really mature enough. It doesn't get enough time to evolve to be something big enough to be intelligent. Maybe they're always uh, stuck in, in a very primitive state because they keep getting annihilated by nat natural or uh, cosmic disasters. Um, I'm not sure about this one um, because, well, I'm not sure about any of these ones. Who, who knows about any of them? But the, the reasons that you could doubt for this one would be that we saw something like this happen to Earth, of course, um, probably more than even once. But this took out the dinosaurs, a giant meteor. Um, and Earth got better. Dinosaurs had their own smart tricks, and they were pretty intelligent on their own. If they had more time, they might have come to dominate the planet like we did. Um, didn't seem like it, though. They seemed to be pretty stagnant. Maybe that's its own reason, but... These, uh, these extinction events don't seem to be the, uh, the complete end of a planet. We recovered from that, and it didn't take us that long, only a handful of million of years before life was, was cooking again. Um, so does this really mean that in more dangerous areas you can't get life? Is that really the solution to this problem? I don't know, but maybe it's a contributing factor, um, or, or maybe it's a lot more important than I think. Um, next bit, um, maybe there are lots of civilizations, but um, just because of the length of our civilizations, we don't overlap. Like, look at this timeline. Maybe we are existing right here. And maybe a long time ago, there was a different civilization that existed that we never met. We, our timelines didn't overlap. Um, here's the examples on Earth. You can see uh, Egypt went on for a huge amount of time. Um, China has gone on for a huge, huge amount of time. If you ever had to study Chinese history, you would be overloaded with facts. Look at all those years. Um, the Greeks went on for this long. Hindus for this long. Um, the Dark Ages, um, like knights and stuff, was that long. Uh, Arabian uh, period transmission. But you can see all these different times of these different great empires of the world. But um, let's say the... Uh, um, the, the Hindu, the, well, let, let, me, let me find a better example here. Um, this modern first half peoples, right? They, they didn't exist at the same time. They started after the Greeks were already done. And so maybe there's a bunch of civilizations out there, but none of us really overlap very much, right? Just like how all these different kingdoms existed on Earth, but they didn't overlap in time. Um, next one is about this one, this F of C. Um, we are looking for things out there using radio. Now, some people think radio is kind of out of date, um, but the concept of using radio waves to communicate probably will never go out of style, um, unless, unless I'm wrong about that. So let's talk about if I am wrong, maybe radio as itself is not the more, most advanced form of communicating. Um, radio is a natural phenomenon. It's not an invention. It's more of a uh, harnessing a natural tool. Um, it's it, they're natural waves that exist, the, the transmissions of energy. Um, we harness this for communication, and, and we assume that probably everyone would do the same thing. It's very useful, but there are some limits to using uh, uh, waves, to using um, uh, electromagnetic waves like this, in that they're limited to a certain speed, the speed of light. And so if maybe in the future they found something that was better, that could uh, talk at the speed of light, uh, maybe they don't use radio anymore. And so maybe this F of C ends sometime, and that would mess up the equation. That if things stop using radio, um, then we wouldn't be able to see them because we're looking for radio. Um, some counterpoints to that, though. Um, imagine old school technology on Earth. Um, I know that my grandmother uses a first-generation iPad. Um, you can't do selfies on the thing. You can't. I mean, you can't do anything on the thing because it's slow as all heck. But um, outdated technology doesn't just go away. And so, if a civilization does advance beyond radio, did every single member of their species advance beyond radio? Nobody's using radio anymore. You really want me to believe that? I'm not sure about that, but maybe, maybe they never, maybe they stop using radio or maybe they use something that's better and they never bother using it. I don't know. 
um, but maybe there's a problem with the radio idea. That's that's one idea. All right. Next one. This one's a little juicy. Um, maybe aliens know very much know that we're here. Maybe they have been here. Maybe they've watched us. Maybe UFOs have visited and they abduct people and poke at them sometimes. And maybe they like coming to Earth and they know everything about us. Maybe we're like an attraction to them, like a zoo. They want to see. Oh, what are those monkey people doing on that planet? You know, uh, maybe they like watching, you know, us stumble around in our daily lives and try to figure out meaningness and, and I don't know, all the other complicated things of existence. Um, maybe it's entertaining to them and, and we are kept as pets or like a zoo. Um, that's possible. If they didn't want us to detect them, if they had advanced spaceships and stuff, I'm sure they'd have some kind of advanced technology that could hide themselves from us and we wouldn't know that we're being watched. Um, of course, there are maybe some people that believe that the government already knows the aliens are doing this. I'm not sure if that's the truth or not. I, I don't think that our government would be very good at keeping secrets, but maybe. I'm not sure. Number nine, um, maybe it is dangerous to communicate in general. Maybe uh, people have kind of realized as they're looking at the stars, other civilizations, maybe they realize it's very quiet out there and they came to the conclusion that, well, if the whole room is quiet, Maybe I shouldn't speak up. Imagine, imagine you were walking into a classroom, say, and everyone was dead silent. But there's a bunch of people there, but everyone was dead silent. Would you start making a bunch of noise? Probably not. You'd, you'd think that there was something going on. So you'd, you'd look around and try to figure it out first before you made some noise. Maybe, maybe everyone is operating under the idea that it's kind of dangerous to, to say, hey, what's up, guys? Maybe we shouldn't do that. Um, and there's good reasons to think that. I mean, if aliens did come here, who knows what they want? Maybe they, they wouldn't be friendly if they arrived. Maybe it'd be better to just not meet them at all. And then number 10, of course, maybe they're here already. I mean, who knows? Maybe they can shapeshift and there's lizard people. I, who knows? I, mean, I, I hope so. Um, let's go ahead and talk a little bit about the government and what the government may or may not know and, and how they've been involved in, in the story of aliens. Um, mostly through uh, the uh, last century up to today. So um, a couple things to talk about. Um, there was a UFO crash in Roswell, New Mexico, not far from here. If you, if you go to that place, that town in New Mexico, uh, there is UFO like um, memorabilia everywhere, like souvenirs uh, of UFO stuff all over the place because supposedly a UFO, a flying saucer crashed in Roswell. Right. And then um, this is uh, Area 51. Okay, so um, let me tell you a little bit about both. Um, with, uh, well, uh... all right, let's talk a little bit about the government and what the American government knows and what it's done, what it's been complicit in, in the last hundred years or so, um, I mostly want to bring up two main events, two main uh, aspects, two main topics. Um, the first one is going to be Area 51, of course. Now, Area 51, a lot of people think that this is a place where there is testing on aliens going on, where, uh, you know, they're keeping, uh, you know, extraterrestrials locked up and they have all sorts of technology in there and crazy things. I think the truth in, in it is that no, that's probably not the case. Um, at the very least, not anymore, but probably not ever. Um, if it was the place where they had all that stuff, they would have definitely moved it by now because, I mean, everyone knows. Um, but if I, I don't think that that story was ever true in the first place. What I think is much more likely is that this was a base where they were used to build their spy planes. Spy planes were heavily used in the last hundred years to spy on the Soviet Union. Um, having an upper hand on them was a very big deal in the Cold War. We wanted to know what they were up to, so creating spy planes was a big deal to us. And that was beyond top secret. We did not want any information getting out about how many of these spy planes we were making, what the condition of them are, what the technology they have on board, how high they can fly, anything about them. We wanted to be completely secret. And so if the government or if the if the general population was thinking that this Area 51 was some some aliens nonsense, 
Well, they don't think it's spy planes then, and so that, that throws them off the trail. The government was not too upset about the general population believing that there were aliens here. It throws them off the trail of what they were really doing, which was designing, manufacturing spy planes. Um, that's what I believe the, the base actually was for. I mean, the whole architecture does seem like it. Um, however, if that's not the case, then that's not the case. We won't know, but I think it's very unlikely that that is the place, at least not anymore. I mean, if... if if it at one point in time did have something valuable there, it's probably been moved because of how high profile it is now. The second thing I want to talk about is Roswell. Um, if anyone's been to Roswell, New Mexico, it's not too far from here. Um, there is UFO stuff there, as far as you can see, like flying saucer stuff there, like uh, souvenirs and memorabilia and signs and everything you can imagine um, of UFO themed or alien themed. Um, the reason why is back in, uh, I think it was like 1950, maybe a little earlier, um, in Roswell, there was supposedly a crashed UFO there, a crashed flying saucer. And this was like the first national incident of people saying, hey, maybe there's, there's aliens flying among us, or one of the first. All right, so let's talk a little bit about that, though. Um, with that crashed UFO, it, it's likely that that goes back to the Cold War as well. Um, during the Cold War, there was this top secret government project called Project Mogul. Um, so here's a little timeline where it fits in. Um, between the 6th and the 9th of August um, in 1945, that's when the United States dropped uh, the atomic bombs in Nagasaki and Hiroshima, and they surrendered shortly after there, September 2nd. That was the the end of the World War II. Um, so that was kind of a start of a new world where there's no more war anymore. So, uh, they, they surrendered, countries were giving up their old conflicts and now there were nuclear bombs in the scene and only America had them for the time being. Um, in 1947, so uh, yeah, 1947 is the day, that's when we had this Roswell incident happen, this newspaper, okay, 1947. New Mexico, United States. Um, something crashes down on a farmer's plot. They think it's aliens. And 1949, two years after that, doesn't seem so related, but let me explain. Two years after that, the Soviets, the USSR, that was the Soviets' abbreviation, like we're USA, they were USSR. Um, they tested their first nuclear weapon in 49. So, what we know now about Project Mogul is that during this time frame, right in here, between 45 and 49, the United States really, really, really wanted to know if the Soviet unions had atom bombs yet. As far as they knew, the Soviets didn't have it, but they knew it was only a matter of time before the Soviets got it too. So they were trying their very best to figure it out. And what one of the things they designed to figure that out was a giant hot air balloon, you can see it right here, it would go way up into the atmosphere, and it has a little pressure sensors on it. And if way across the, the world there was an atom bomb explosion, way across the world, that pressure wave would travel through the really low density upper atmosphere all the way around the world and hit that pressure sensor. And then this thing would come back with a little broken vial inside of it, and it would be basically as a piece of evidence that said, hey, the Soviets set off a bomb, or someone set off a bomb, and odds are it would be the next powerful guys, the Soviets. So it was a very early spying attempt on our, our on our enemy to figure out when they had gotten atomic bombs. Um, this project was going around, like it's been confirmed, this is a, a thing that happened. We were trying to figure out when they got atom bombs. Um, and it's very likely, based on the equipment that was there and the timing of the event, that the Roswell incident was one of these things crashing. Um, the government's denial of that event uh, was basically them trying to deny any any ideas that they could be spying on this USSR. Remember that in World War II, we were allies with Russia, we were friends, but now things were getting really bad, and things would have gotten bad really fast if they knew that we were spying on them like this. So, makes better sense for the government to deny it, makes better sense for the government to be happy for them to think it was aliens, and the legacy of that event still lives on today. You can go visit Roswell and, and check out all the alien merchandise. Okay, um, let's switch gears a little bit. Um, I would like to talk about light speed travel because a lot of what we think about aliens is uh, dependent on the ability to jump from star to star to go from one part of the galaxy to another. And maybe that's just straight up not possible. Um, let's, let's think about the speed of light. 
So light's extremely fast. The, the photons traveling from a light bulb as soon as you turn on the switch, flying out to the other corner of the room, they fly so fast that it may as well be instant. It may as well be teleportation because it's so fast. But it's not infinitely fast. It does have a specific speed. It is 670 million miles per hour. That's how fast uh, a little beam of light travels. It goes extremely fast. Now, can we go faster than that? Is it possible for people to go faster than that? As far as scientists can tell, no. Um, there's a few people that think maybe, but as most scientists think no, that's, that's pretty much the speed limit. You're not going to be able to just apply more gas, just apply a bigger rocket booster, just to spin the wheels faster. You're never going to be able to accelerate faster than that speed. Um, here's a little bit more math, though, if you want to want to look at that. If you look at that miles per hour, if you want to like consider that in terms of like units, you can imagine. Um, think about think about a meter stick. Think about like a regular yardstick. If you could go 300 million of those in one second, that'd be about how fast light's going. Um, or if you could go almost 200,000 miles in a second. Or if you were to put that into final terms, around the world in seven and a half times every one second. So time out a second, one, two, three, four. That's each second, seven and a half times you can go around the planet Earth at that speed. How fast light travels. Yeah. So um, here's a here's a video question now, or not a video question, worksheet question for you. Number six. Um, write down one of these ones, the one that makes the most sense to your brain if you're trying to imagine it. Any of these units, how fast that is. Write down how fast is the speed of light in in any one of these terms. All right. If you haven't got that done, go ahead and pause. I'm going to move on to the next slide. So regarding light, light behaves in very, beha very, very strange ways. We, we don't understand everything there is to know about light yet, but we do know some things about it. One of the things that we found out that was very surprising is that um, there's a reason why nothing goes faster than the speed of light. There's a reason to it. The faster that you go, the faster like that you're moving through space, um, even when it's empty. Um, you gain mass. You you actually get um, heavier. Well, heavy is really talking about weight, and weight is mass plus gravity. But there's this inherent unit to something called mass, and it's kind of like weight. It's how much stuff there is there. Um, you get more massive the closer to speed of life you get. So the, the faster you go, the, the more stuff, the more force it takes to, to get you going, the more resistant to force you get. Um, so as you approach the speed of light, it takes more and more force to get you to accelerate any, any faster than, than you're already going. Um, as, as you get closer and closer to that speed of light, the amount of force it takes to get you to go any faster gets higher and higher and higher, and eventually it gets to infinity. It would take more energy than there is energy out there to get you to accelerate any faster. And you still wouldn't even be quite at the speed of light, you'd just be very, very, very close. The speed of light is a limit, not because you, you accelerate up to something and then you just all of a sudden slow down. It's that you, you cannot accelerate anything faster than that, um, just due to the ways that the laws of phys physics come into play as you get to that extreme end of speed. Oh, um, one more thing to add with, uh, with that is the faster you go to, the slower everything around you goes, and as you go to the speed of light, Physics gets so bent by then, so broken, or at least to our minds, it doesn't really get broken. It always works this way. But it's so weird at that extreme end of physics that time would actually slow down. And as you get to the speed of light, if you were to actually reach the point, time would stop altogether. Now, you'll never go to the speed of light because of the way that this math is set up, so you'll never stop time doing that. But if things go extremely fast, it actually does slow down then. Um, one example of this is with satellites orbiting around the Earth. When they fly around in circles around the Earth, they're going extremely fast. Nowhere near the speed of light, but really fast. Um, and their computers actually have to take account that time is going slower for them flying around there than it is on the surface of the Earth. So their little clocks inside of them, they have to be set to a different speed than the ones on the surface of the Earth. Because the closer to the, the extreme ends of, of speed that you go to, you go to extremely high speeds, time actually goes slightly slower. And if you go to the speed of light, time would actually stop altogether. Strange stuff. 
Um, there's a lot in physics that people don't understand yet. I don't have answers to a lot of that stuff. Um, oh, another thing is that no matter where you are or no matter uh, how fast you're going, the speed of light's always going the speed of light. So if you were in a spaceship, like this is a, a spaceship from a, a video game, if it was flying at the speed of light and you had a little flashlight, you turned on the flashlight in front of you, or if you had headlights on the spaceship, the light would still be going the speed of light away from you. It's still going the speed of light for all observers. So I, sitting on the spaceship, would see that, that light going the speed of light away from me. But someone that's sitting still would also see the speed of light going the speed of light. It's like contradictory. What I would see would be different than what someone else sees. Very, very strange how it goes. Light seems to only really care about you watching, not any other people observing what it is. Um, there must be some things about light that we're just not understanding yet as a species. Okay, so that begs the question, is it possible to break the speed of light? Um, well, it depends on, on how you ask that. Um, in terms of just attaching more thrusters or more wheels or giving it more fuel, no, it's not possible. But there are certain things you can do that are faster than light. Let me give you an example. Um, imagine that it was a really dark night and there is a nice dark moon out there, but you can still see it, but it's dark enough that you could shine a super powerful laser onto it. Like I'm talking a real powerful laser. And that laser dot ended up on the surface of the moon. If you were to just sweep your arm, if you were to just swing that laser, that laser dot would travel all the way across the surface of the moon, right? If it came out from your hand and you just sweeped your arm, that laser would go all the way across the moon. You start at one end of the moon and it would go all the way across. If it did that, it would be traveling this many meters. This is how, how wide the moon is, three and a half million meters. If you were to do that in, say, like a hundredth of a second, if you just like real quick, like swoosh, right through it, that beam of light, that little dot, would move faster than light. It would go faster than, than this distance, and that amount of seconds is faster than light. So it wouldn't be very hard to do that, to make a little laser pointer just dash across the moon, and technically that laser light is going faster than the speed of light. You'd have to swing your hand pretty fast, given. Like, you'd have to swing it, like, pretty fast. But it wouldn't be impossible. You could certainly do a, a machine that could spin it that fast. If you hooked it up to like a like a house fan and it was spinning around real fast, you could swipe it past there that fast. Uh, not impossible. So does that break the rules? Not exactly. Not exactly. That real dot on the surface, even though it's moving faster than the speed of light, there's no way you can use that to move a person or to move a spaceship or to move an object. It's just a beam of light. So it, it's not exactly the same. It's not a solution to the problem. Even though it seems like, well, there might be things out there that could go faster than light, but good luck trying to find out some, some kind of way you can, you can make something useful with that. I can't think of anything. Another idea is wormholes. Um, I, I just brought it up because people know about them, but um, as far as we know, this is science fiction, but um, space in a lot of ways, it acts like fabric that if there's something really heavy, it would like dent the fabric. And then like, if you had maybe like a marble, it would kind of roll around in that bowl shape that that dent would make. That's kind of what gravity does. Things kind of roll around in circles around something. Um, space is kind of like a fabric. And so some people think maybe you could just fold the fabric. I don't, I don't know. <laughs> Go ahead and do it, dude. You should do it. You guys should fold that fabric so we can go through it. Um, likewise, maybe there's less bizarre ways. Um, instead of folding the fabric, maybe we can just use gravity in kind of a way. Maybe we can just dent the fabric. Maybe we could form a little bubble and then just move the fabric. Instead of actually having flying us around, maybe we can just change the space around us, form a little bubble, and then just tumble through in our own little pocket. Maybe the space itself is not bound to the speed of light. That would be called the Alcubierre drive. It's an idea for a warp drive and probably the most popular idea of, of maybe possible faster than light engines out there, the Alcubierre drive. Um, that said, it's still very theoretical. There's no, there's no guarantee that this is even possible in the first place. Um, but the idea is you don't yourself fly, you don't fly, but you put yourself in a bubble of space and you make the space move. Um, 
interesting way. It would technically not break the speed of light because you would not be moving. The space would be would be relocating. So who knows? All right. Next question. This one is going to be a conversation starter, and then uh, I will tell you some things that we should or should not think about um, aliens when we're forming a mental picture in our heads of what they look like. So. On your paper, um, on your digital document, go ahead and answer this next question. What should aliens look like? What would they visually look like? Is, For example, is this picture, is an alien likely to look like this? Go ahead and record your answer. Try to answer the question to the best of, uh, to the, to the fullest and best of your ability. 